intended to be the beginning. Uh, this is intended to be the beginning class in a series of classes which I'm putting together. And so we're going to just kind of cover some basics and talk about some simple hats. Um, so what is millinery? Um, the, the meaning of the word millinery has actually changed over time. Um, I've actually found opposing, uh, opposing um, sources saying what they mean. Generally, though, the consensus is it, 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 it's from the word Milan um, in about the 16th century. Uh, little shops were opened to carry products, um, the products of what's kind of under contention. Some sources say that it was uh, felt and hat making supplies. Others just say it's small goods from Milan. And so that turned into the word millinery um, because, they, um, because they carried items um, which went into you making women's hats. Millinery then changed to become to, to be used as um, to mean women's hats or a place where someone would make women's hats or buy women's hats. Um, I have on here, you say millinery versus haberdashery. Um, again, that's something in contention. A lot of my research has shown that um, millinery is specifically women's hats, whereas haberdashery can often mean the ribbons and bows and, and other things. Um, however, in college, we were always taught to, we, we designated them differently. We said millinery was hats specifically and haberdashery was men's hats and small men's, men's wear such as ties and and shoes and things like that. Um, so again, that is a little, it's a little interesting to see that um, words have different meanings depending on where you look or depending regionally even. Um, now millinery is becoming more and more just referred to hats in general. Uh, you'll still find people who think of millinery as women's hats, but it's becoming a uh, less genderized term um, and we're looking to expand it just to just be a, a term for hats in general. Um, traits of the milliner, these are taken from, these I have, I have taken from uh, the book From the Neck Up, an illustrated guide to hat making uh, by Denise Dreher. Um, it talks in the beginning about how, and I have these up because um, I personally, I teach at a university or I work at a university in a costume shop. And so these are often things that I have to instill in students when they're coming in. Um, and people, if you're people who are beginning a skill, um, it's important, even if you are already skilled in something, it's important to remember that things take practice. So you need to constantly improve, strive to improve your skills and uh, work on them. And you need patience with millinery because uh, there are time consuming things and you use a lot of trial and error. Um, it's not just, there are things you can make quickly. A lot of the hats we'll be talking about today, the hats we'll be talking about today are simple and easy, you can make quickly. But when you get into things like hat blocking and working with felts and leathers and things like that, you have to take the time to let things dry and cool or you will be working against yourself the whole time. Um, you need to have confidence to, and be willing to try new methods and skills. Um, what I do in my job is not just hats, I do costume crafts or sometimes called costume props. So uh, within the costume shop itself, there's a set basic, there's a basic set of skills that people use within a costume shop for hand sewing and machine sewing and everything. Um, but those don't always translate to needing to do the same things for costume crafts. Um, yes, you'll thread the needle the same. Yes, you'll use a machine the same. Um, but the specific stitch you use in costume crafts and in millinery is not always the same. Often it is a lot of trial and error and R&D. Um, and then a light touch, knowing when to stop adding and avoid overhandling. Um, it's really easy to to uh, overpress something in a hat where you, you'll lose the loft of a felt if you overpress it, or you can uh, pull your stitches too tight and they'll be visible. So those are the traits of a milliner. And again, it's especially with the practice patience confidence, those are the three that are really especially important um, to remind new 
people who are new to the to millinery or any skill to just to have. <laughs> Elements of design. Again, this is I take a lot of this first information from from the neck up an illustrated guide. It is a book which is um, it is no longer in print, but you can still find it at some shops. And it's one I highly recommend because it's set up to where um, as lesson plans. And so it starts with all of this information in the beginning. So elements of the design, there's line, which is the angle, curvature, and movement, the size, the length, the height, the thickness. So, you know, a lot of these are pretty self-explanatory. The shape, contour, pointedness, circumscription, excuse me, or complexity. Uh, the mass is important. These are all things that you need to consider when looking at a hat or looking at creating a hat or a garment or anything. Um, position, density, texture, color. Um, they will all have an impact, especially if you want to match a specific time period or place. Um, different, different locations, different time periods will have different, will have uses for different fabrics. They'll have different fabrics that are used, different weights of fabric. Um, different prints. Um, so they're, they all go into the design of a, of a hat. Um, I took this little graphic to show because it's a really good graphic, uh, again, from the neck up. And it shows that these lines show how a hat can change the silhouette of a wearer through the use of line. Um, so if you look across, the lines themselves, the upright, the vertical part are all the same height but you can see how it changes. And then the picture I show with uh, my housemate, Taryn Destinger, um, we were in our German garb and it shows that we're, we're actually fairly close in height. She's only slightly taller than me, but with her hat and the line of it, it makes her look much taller than I am, even though I'm wearing a large, you know, stuffed um, German head wrap. Basic equipment and materials. Um, these are, there are many more materials enlisted here, obviously. Um, these are the ones I tend to use the most often in what I do. Um, so a hat or brim block with a stand. Um, boning. Oh, oh yep. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a question? Okay. Um, boning, I have this on here. I don't often bone my hats, but I usually have a piece of flat steel boning for when I am blocking hats with steam um, because it's so flexible and thin. You, I can actually use it to pry gently, pry a hat off of a, a hat block without damaging the hat itself or the blocked shape. Um, so it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, oh, that's good to have there. Uh, elastic, again, when holding um, when holding a felt shape onto a hat block, I have a really tight piece of half inch elastic uh, that I put around it to pull down because pins, when you pin through felt, um, it leaves the holes. You basically steam holes into the felt. Um, so there are different ways. I use elastic, there are clips and different ways to hold them down. There's weights and a lot of things that I personally haven't used yet, but I'd love to. Um, and of course, a steam iron, a hat steamer, or in a pinch of tea kettle. Um, you can use those if you're working on steaming anything into shape. A damp cloth or even a spray bottle of water works well um, if you want to get a little bit deeper of a steam or get a, a nice crisp line. Uh, a tailor's point or pressing block. Again, if I'm going too quickly, please just say, hey, slow down. Um, or if you have questions, again, just stop. Just ask me. Um, a tailor's point or pressing block is really nice because um, the block helps maintain the heat from an iron if you're like, so for example, if I'm doing a cavalier hat and um, I want a nice, smooth, stiff brim, um, you have to steam it and press it. But then if you keep the heat on too much, you can ruin the fibers. And so you um, use the pressing block to hold it down to kind of get, put some weight on it um, and do that. Plastic wrap or tin foil, 
you always want to wrap your blocks, um, your hat blocks, because you're not just steaming them. You're also often going to be using the hat block if you use sizing as well. Um, and you don't want to get sizing on your on your hat blocks. They're they're expensive. Just don't don't you mess them up. <laughs> um, a hat stretcher. Um, obviously, that's used more for like if you find something at a thrift store or like me work in theater and you're like, oh, I just need a little bit more. Um, you can use a stretcher with steam. Um, milliners and, oh, excuse, I, I got that wrong. They're Glover's needles or curved needles, not millet. Well, they have milliners needles. I tend to use Glover's needles or curved needles. Um, the curved needles tend to be, to work really well if you're adding decoration to a straw hat or something with a large brim. Um, so you can just kind of get in there and curve it around. The Glover's needles, um, if you're not familiar with them, they are, um, they have the, the sharp end um, is more like a tri-blade kind of, kind of like a, a triangle. So if you puncture yourself with the needle, um, you have a little triangle hole, triangular hole. Um, but it's made for going through leather um, and works really well for difficult fabrics as well. Milliner's needles are nice though too because they are a they are a smooth, long, thin hand sewing needle with a small eye so that they don't create a large hole. It's not like an embroidery ne an embroidery needle where it has a large hole. Um, so it won't cause a large hole in your in your hat. Sizing fluid. Um, I can talk about that a little bit more later. That's something you want to be careful with because you want to find one that works really well for you because um, a lot of fluids and adhesives and things are toxic. Um, so you don't want to use them in, in uh, an enclosed space. Um, there's one that I use that comes from a company here in Oregon that um, is not toxic and it doesn't have, it doesn't tend to have a residue um, unless you steam it before it's dry. Um, it's, it's fascinating with, with sizing. Um, if you see a hat that has kind of that sizing on the surface, it usually means it's been steamed before the sizing has fully dried because um, it's how the steam kind of locks in the fibers and yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, buckram felt fabric leather. I, buckram is great. Um, it's very versatile. You can frame it with millinery wire or you can shape it with water and let it dry. The biggest thing with that though, is that if it gets wet, it will lose its shape. So um, you wanna make sure, you know, if it's gonna rain or not, or if you expect to get wet with that. Um, felt, as I mentioned earlier with the, with millinery, um, felt used to come from Milan. Now, more often than not, you find felt hoods and things, um, from Poland, from Poland. Um, obviously fabric, wherever you want to get it from and leather or, or, um, or vinyl, if you prefer not using animal products. Um, Millinery wire comes in a very variety of gauges. Um, it's wrapped, it's a wire that is wrapped with a rayon thread um, so that you, it helps cut the shine um, from, like you can help, it will help it blend into the fabrics so it doesn't show through, but it's also a really good, uh, it's just a good wire to work with, honestly. Um, so of course you would need wire cutters and I use a needle file on the edges of my millinery wire so it doesn't catch and snag people. And a tailor's all, I, I like that specifically, the tailor's all, not like the really bulky all, but the one that is thin, tiny, tiny point works really well. Um, and then you need to know about the parts of the hat. So again, here, not all hats will have these parts, these specific parts, like not all hats will have a brim. Um, but generally speaking, you have the brim, the crown, and then um, all the way up to the tip. So it's good to know kind of the basics of 
get to learn the basics of um, what comprises a hat um, because that is the language we'll use to communicate. Like you speak to someone, uh, it, it should be, we should have a shared language for the parts so that we know what we're talking about. So the crown is the overall part that goes over your head, but it's comprised of the sideband of the tip. Um, because it, it, it can make a difference. <laughs> um, here I have this useful sheet. This is from, again, from the neck up. <laughs> um, but it shows kind of the ways in which you would go about measuring your head. And um, so most people, they just will, if they're going to measure the head, most people do the, the basic measurement, head measurement, which is just fully around the circumference of their head. Um, we don't always often, I mean, I've fallen into this pit where you forgot, you forget to um, account for the hairstyle under the hat. Um, you wanna also figure out the angle the hat will be worn. So that, will, that can change the measurements. Um, what is the hat made out of and how many layers of materials? So um, that's, these are the questions you ask to determine how much ease you build into that, build into a hat. Because like, like clothing, you wanna add ease to your hats as well, because uh, unless you want it specifically to be skin tight and really tight and you know, like a cowboy hat is not supposed to fall off a cowboy's head, right? So they have them super tight. Um, but most of what we would do would wear in the SEA, you don't really want them that tight. You wanna build in some ease and figure out like how much. So like you can show, see in the picture here, how there's a feminine silhouette with a bun in, in their hair and they're measuring the hair as well. Um, and if you if someone's wearing a wig underneath, make sure the wig is on the person's head if they're gonna be wearing it under the hat. Um, also, I like to consider people's health concerns because sometimes if someone is um, uh, has difficulty hearing, you don't wanna cover their ears or if there's um, someone overheats a lot, that will, and that will um, tell you what kind of materials you wanna use. You wanna stick with more natural materials and stay away from like, don't put thermoplastic on someone who's gonna overheat. Um, and expected weather, again, that's because of like, if you're using buckram and you're in a downpour, you're gonna have a very sad hat. Um, this one, I'm going to, I'm going to um, see if I can get a royalty-free version of this oval pattern so that I can add it to um, a handout that I can send out um, because it's really useful. It has the center front, front and center back marked. Um, this oval, if printed out on a regular size sheet of paper, so an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, um, it, the oval is formatted to fit basically a size 22 head. Um, and then you can just use a ruler and add and subtract to make different head sizes. So what I have here is an eighth inch added all around um, increases the circumference by a half inch total. So for example, if this is a 22 inch oval and you want to have, you will need to make something for someone that's a 22 and a half inch head or excuse me, 22 inch head, but you want to do a half inch of, of, um, of ease. Um, you want to add an eighth inch, just trace around the whole thing, an eighth of an inch out, and that will give you a 22 and a half inch shape. Any questions so far? Okay. Going through this quickly. <laughs> nope. Okay. Okay, so that eighth of an inch um, is pretty much for uh, calculated for around 21, 22 inches. Um, it's, it's for any size. So you can go from any size. So if you start with like this one, I say it's for 22 because um, if you print out this sheet uh -huh. um, on an eight and a half by 11, it's formatted for a 22 inch head. That's so fair. you can take this oval and if you add half an inch all around, 
or excuse me, if you add a quarter inch all around, you're going to be raising it by a full inch. So about every eighth of an inch increment that you add onto it will raise the circumference, will add it, will add a half an inch to the total circumference. Um, and you can decrease it as well, obviously. Okay, thank you. And I think that works with pretty much anything circular, oval, round, like in. So it's so this is something that will work really well if you're also not making hats, but you have circles for that you have to cut out for other costumes. I mean, like I said, I do costume crafts, so I have to do I have to cut out some weird things sometimes. <laughs> It's just a calculation to really keep in mind. Okay, so then the bag hat, this is an image from the Medieval Tailor's Assistant, um, the second edition. Um, I put this in here because I, I've used their instructions for making bag hats. Um, and they're so simple. It's so nice because it's just, um, you cut out two of these long um, ovals, tall ovals, I guess you can call them. Um, and you have a single seam and you can, as it shows in the illustration, you can either roll it up and do that, or you can change the shape. So instead of doing the oval in the top, you can cut it out more and um, um, you can, just you can you can play with the shape so it's it's really um versatile it's a great project for first time sewers if you have people in your branch who are wanting to be garbed or they want to have a complete look but they don't necessarily have the skills or a lot of fabrics or anything this is something that's so simple just to say okay what's your head measurement cut it a little larger because as you roll the end as you roll the bottom it will tighten up um and you can roll it all the way up to where it looks like just a like a little skull cap with a big padded roll around, or you can have the floppy bit hanging over. You can cut it to look like uh, a nightcap. Um, I've played with shapes. Um, I've played with shapes before where I made it to where I just had basically a long lira peep that you can just wrap around the head afterwards as well. Um, so it's really versatile. It's simple. It's easy. It's a really quick, I, I would say for a beginner, I would say maybe a two hour hat, depending on how they're sewing. Um, just because sometimes like making sure measurements are right, it's not gonna, it, it very likely won't take people that long, but I'd like to give more time so people don't feel pressure. Um, so, um, and it's really, just that simple. <laughs> um, the main thing is though, you can make it more complicated by bag lining it and doing two fabrics so that you don't see the seams when it's rolled up. So it's something that you can make more complicated. You can add embroidery to it. Um, but again, it's just really easy. Hey, you're new to the branch. You don't know how to sew. Let's do this for you. Um, and then with, okay, some people say coif, some people say coifs. I'm not sure if, I, if anyone has a preference. Um, but these are two different images. The one on the left is again from the medieval tailor's assistant. And the one on the right is from, from the neck up. Um, these are actually different styles of coifs. Um, the one from the medieval tailor's assistant, you can see it is, um, essentially they have a shape that's on a fold. And so you can either cut it out if you see the coifs that people embroider when they're just flat, you can cut it out like that, or you can cut out two pieces as it, like this, like in the image and add, um, and add the drawstring and binding. Or like the image on the right, um, and I made both versions as well. Um, otherwise I wouldn't put them up here. Um, the image on the right from, from the neck up has a third piece. So you cut out the side pieces and then you have kind of this weird football shape 
piece that goes from the center front all the way back to the nape of the neck. Um, and these are easy. I, I um, again, they're easy. They're a little more complicated than the bag hats because they have shaping to them, like more specific shaping to them. The nice thing is they work for a variety of looks and time periods. As I mentioned, they can be highly decorated. They can, uh, people will just full on embroider them often. Um, or they can be used as arming caps. So it's like, if you have a little tie, I know people who make variations of these to hold their hair up, um, they fight steel. And so they'll, hold their, they'll use it to hold their hair up out of the, out of the gorget. Um, and I have literally made these out of fabric scraps. Someone cut out a tunic and there were just a couple triangles of fabric left and I took it and just made a hat out of it. So could you speak a little to the time periods like the bag hat and these coifs? What time period those might've been most often seen in? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the bag hat is gonna be um, more from, it's more medieval. So it's more um, 1100s to the 1480s. Like the, it's um, like what the medieval tailor's assistant shows. They kind of cover that. Um, I think it's, they're more towards the later part of that period. Um, and the coifs are, they have a longer time period um, because they have, they have different variations. Um, you can see them as early as that. They are also layerable. And um, so they go, like you see a version of a coif underneath a French hood. Um, you'll see them as arming caps. You'll see them underneath by pockets. Um, so most of these are generally thought of as medieval hats, um, like just in gener general terms, generic terms. Um, but the coif has, it, it expands, um, it has, um, you see it up into the Renaissance as well. And um, mainly because the coif was also used as a, a protective layer oftentimes. So, um, under a French hood or a gable hood um, or anything like that that is made out of velvets and silks and, and taffetas, um, you'd wear a linen or, a, well, probably linen coif um, to help your, keep your hair oils off of the nicer, more expensive fabrics. Um, it also helps hold your hair in place, like I said, like with the arming cap, or um, we've done some, my friend and I have done some tests with the, um, how the hair is underneath a French hood to help hold the French hood in place. Um, and the coif really helps hold that style in place as well. Does that help? Does that answer your question? It did, thank you. Thanks. And then um, with the bicockets, um, this is from, from the neck up. Um, the nice thing is from the neck up has these gridded out sections and um, they say in it that it's intended to be um, a general shaping and sizing for a 22 inch head because at the time when the, the in 1981, a 22 inch head was the average size head. So that's kind of like what they did. Um, the, the interesting thing is I have a sample of this bicocket that I, I made, I made a mock-up of it. <laughs> um, and the thing with it is you see how, like if you look at where it shows to fold, um, it shows to fold up for the brim, but it also shows that, um, oh, let's see. If you look at the top curve, there's a fold. And if you look at the illustration of the person wearing it, it shows that instead of having a closed seam, it was a, it was, it was closed, but it was folded in on top of the head. I tried that. It did not work that well. Granted, I was using bulkier fabrics, but in order to get the stand of that, of that brim, you need a bulkier fabric. So I, I have a hat that it has that full height like that. And I call it my doofy gnome hat. Um, because that is basically what it is. It's a bicocket technically, um, but it's really the doofy gnome hat. 
<laughs> um, they're also versatile in style and materials. You'll see them made out of leather. You'll see them fully blocked um, and made out of, I know uh, Charles de Bourbon, he's from several kingdoms. He does gorgeous bicockets um, out of uh, blocked felt and then trims them with fur. There's still fairly easy to make, not necessarily the blocked ones, because you have to have the right head block for the shape. Um, but they're fairly easy to make once you kind of know what, what you wanna do with it. Um, it still uses minimal materials. It uses, I think, less or fewer materials than the bag hat, in fact. Um, and you can wear it with a hat pin and feathers. I, anytime you can dress it up, it's exciting, right? Um, and then the joke is that the bicocket is the medieval baseball cap because um, there are, I apologize for not having examples of these illuminations, but there are illuminations where it shows people working in a field with their bike hockets on backwards to keep the sun off the back of their neck. Um, and, and it might not seem like it because it narrows out so much, but a bike hocket will actually keep the sun off your face as well. Um, and, but that is all in like any of these hats, I highly recommend making mock-ups if you're doing one for the first time so that, um, you know, cut it out of like a muslin or a sheet or something just to see the basic fit. Um, with these soft hats, that's the nice thing with soft hats, you can do that too. You can be like, oh, I just need a soft material. Um, but the one I have, um, well, I, I will show you the hats I have in a moment. I'll just finish my thing. All right, any other questions so far? Time period for the bicocket? Um, it's, uh, it is also generally medieval. Um, it's one that people will see, you'll see in the SEA people wearing with a variety of time periods though, um, especially if you, if a person, if a pelican is wearing their cap of maintenance, um, many will have them as the bicocket. So, um, I mean, I've, I've worn mine in the modern world. Um, <laughs> yeah, I get weird looks, but how fun. <laughs> um, so I, my question then, before I you know, stop sharing my screen and show you the hats I have with me, what do you want to make? Anyone? <laughs> I have made henan in the past and truly enjoyed wearing them. Um, what I wore was the single point and I had a couple different ones. One was, um, oh, maybe 14 inches tall. And another was closer to a foot and a half. I had a lot of fun with those. I really enjoyed the, the draping and the playing with it. It was fun. So I'd like to make another of those. Doesn't go with my Celtic persona, but I can branch out. <laughs> And I need to find something that does go with my Celtic persona besides a Excellent. scarf. Right. <laughs> um, anyone else? Um, I'm early period too, usually. And do, they must have had some kinds of hats besides just, you know, wrappy things and scarves and veils, I would think. Are, are you aware of anything? They they definitely did. Hoods were very popular. Um, it was, it, I just chose these three to start with because I figured I would start with, because they work really well with the basics of millinery. Um, and then I could, I'll, I plan to show more with subsequent classes as well. Um, but I know um, uh, chaperones with Lira Peeps, um, I know that, oh, I, there's a, I don't have the book with me right now. It's in the other room. Um, I have a book from a dig in Denmark from about 1000 BCE, um, where they recreated, um, the garments that they found in the, in the find, in the archeological find. And they have a number of chaperones as well with Lyra peeps in them. Um, there also were a lot of the structured hats. Um, I have a, I have a horned hat 
for to go with my Burgundian. Um, that one we didn't do. My friend and I, we both have horned hats, and um, it's actually in the. I'm going to shoot from back to the top slide, so please don't get dizzy. <laughs> so this one, um, I have a different veil on that I normally wear, but this is a little a little horned hat that my friend and I made. Um, but we weren't really looking at anything historically. We were just doing it from a theatrical standpoint of how do we get it to stay on our heads? What is, what are we doing? Um, the veil itself is because that was at a pride event. Um, but underneath what we did was we, we made headbands and padded out um, empty serger thread cones <laughs> and um, took metallic thread and stitched a net over black velvet and then used beads um our household we're the house of the honey badger and so our our household device has a semi of bees on it so we have bees and so we used beads to create bees um but yeah so um a lot of those the the hennins and the reticulated headdresses and um there were some really interesting things. There was also a lot of, um, I don't really know as much about CE stuff, um, but you know that they did have some structured things, especially in like Egypt and things as well. You'll find some questions in the comment in the chat. Oh, excellent. Let me, let me uh, stop sharing then. Hello. <laughs> I could have read those for you. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. Yes, I'm going to see. I'm going to um, either see if I can get permission to send you the the um, the uh, measuring uh, guides that I have here, um, or see if I can find one that's royalty free, just to make sure that we're like on the up and up. Uh, Sorry, I'm reading the, um, which graphics font was so tiny, I'm so sorry. It's uh, The graphics were the one just following the format for the head shape, I think, the page okay. that came after that. Oh, with the, was it with the, the one with the measuring the oval? No, or just after the oval. After the oval, okay. Head measurements. Okay. The head measurements. Okay. Yes. That again, it's a full sheet. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'm going to try to get that into a, a handout as well to send the share. I have it. I have it scanned. I could just, I can just send it to you. Um, <clears throat> that next question about the coif, the embroidered and lace insertion, I yes. think that might be the St. Birgitte's cap. Um, it's a similar, yeah. The, the St. So one of the hats I have, like I don't have a coif with me, but I have a Saint Brigitte's cap. Brigitte. I always forget Bridget, Bridget, Bridget. I know it. I, I. <laughs> you would think I would know this. <laughs> it's. I believe it's pronounced Birgitte, but it looks Brigitte. like Bridget because yes. if you go to another country, that's what they're going to say. So this is one that I made. This is the one that I literally made out of scraps. Um, I was at an event and I was really bored and my friend had scraps of a shirt that she made for another household member. And so I stole them <laughs> and made a hat. Um, I have mine different and often you'll see the long ties that will be in a loop, but um, I left mine as separate ties um, because it's linen and linen will stretch a little if you just let it so and and knots will tighten and so i left them as let me see if i can so i'm going to take this off so that i can kind of show you how it goes on the head
the St. Birgitta's cap that she's putting on is very much like the other coifs, but it has a band that runs across the front. And generally, as she said, it's connected to itself and it gets wrapped around your head a couple of times. If you have long hair, you can tuck your long hair up inside it and that wrapped band will hold your hair up kind of not dissimilar to what we might do with a towel when we have wet hair. It's very handy if you're working, cooking, being very active. Okay. So it goes on. I'm sorry, I couldn't Can you hear turn your you're head saying? backwards? Yes. Turn your head backwards so we can see the back. There you can go. You see it? So it has these, so I tie it in the back. I'm going to untie it so you can kind of see. So the difference between this and a coif is that a coif will have the ties that just kind of come down and hang over here. Excuse me. <laughs> While this gathers into sections in the back. Excuse me, just a second. So this has gathers that it just kind of has like a little split from the center seam. Is, are you seeing what I'm is yes, actually showing? Oh, excellent. It's, it's showing. Okay. So it, it gathers into the, uh, into the draw, I'm gonna call it drawstring, it's a little, into the tie. Um, so it's a little different in that sense that like, um, mm. you want it to cover your ears, but instead of it coming under your chin and holding it down, it holds it back and it works really well if you have long hair and you have a braid that you want to hold up in place because you can tie it around and under that hair as Which well. is what I was saying while you had your headphones off. Oh, excellent. <laughs> See, confirmation. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you my doofy gnome hat. Yay. <laughs> um, this, so this one is actually... Um, this one was not made for, uh, this is the second one I made, but it's a little different from the, it's same outer fabric. Um, and this is without it being folded up. The inner fabric on this one is flannel because I made it for a dear friend's mother who was going through breast cancer. Um, and she wore this every time to her, um, to chemo because she was able to turn it backwards and it held because where the chemo plate, where the waiting room for the chemo was, um, there was always an AC vent blowing onto her neck. And so she wore this backwards um, and wore it. And, and then um, I have it back because um, she survived the cancer and passed away in a car accident. So. So I keep it. I actually wear it as a belt favor. So there was another question following the coif question. Um, do you have any information on early Viking period, early Icelandic women's head coverings and hats? Woo, right back to St. Birgitta. I have my other hat that I call a doofy gnome. My other doofy gnome hat. It's, it's not going to look right over the headphones, but this way I can still hear you. But <laughs> um, this is um, one of the little caps. Um, I actually, it's really just a rectangle of fabric. I'm trying to see it right. It's really just a rectangle of fabric. Um, so it creates this fun little point. And then um, my, my apron dress, hang on, just a moment. Um, my apron dress, I had this blue and white trim and um, I have this thing I joke that you can tell a costumer by um, the fact that they often don't have their garb hemmed. At least that <laughs> tends to be my problem. Um, so wearing my apron dress at 50 year, at the 50 year celebration, I was feeling a little self-conscious. So I threw some trim on the bottom of it. Um, and then folded it over and put it on my hat as well. So it works together. 
Um, but yes, yeah, so this is one of the more common one, common styles you see. The fabric I have, um, it's hemp. It's a woven hemp fabric. And um, I lucked out with how I ended up with hemp fabric. But if you're able to get a woven hemp fabric, I highly recommend it because um, it's very stain resistant. Um, you can see it's, it's an oatmeal color, kind of oatmeal color. Um, the very first time I wore my, my um, apron dress, I spilled red wine on it um, and with it like right on the top too. And within an hour it had faded out. Um, I've also another time at a camping event, forgot about the elevation changes and opened mustard one day and just got this whole giant splotch right on the skirt. It did not stain. Um, it also has like, um, it's, has, it's similar to linen feel, but this one is thicker. Um, it insulates when it's cold, but when it's warm outside, the surface of the fabric still stays cool to the touch. So like, I will often just kind of lift up my apron dress and touch my face and cool off a little bit. <laughs> but, um, and, and also, like I said, in, I have a, a book about digs from uh, Norse where they have, um, they have these hats, they have the uh, chaperone style with Lira peeps and they have like just the little um, kind of the pillbox style, the soft pillbox style hats that are just like little caps. Um, I was, I think I was most surprised to, to see the chaperones because you tend to see them uh, a little later in period, so. Next question was, I need Russian Slavic headwear. Russian Slavic, um, feminine or masculine? Um, Cause that will- That was from Magda. Okay. Um, I know feminine Russian Slavic headwear um, is tied to, traditionally is tied to marital status. Um, and so the size and shape and, and uh, complexity of it, um, can often be tied to uh, the marital status. So that will be something that you wanna look at. Um, I don't have as much information right now on Russia and Slavic, but it's one I'm looking into. Um, so I have a question I can... about that. Uh, I've been trying to do a little research for my granddaughter who's doing a Norse persona. Mm -hmm. And I find that because the Norse were busy and traveled a heck of a lot. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, overlap between Norse clothing and the Russian Slavic clothing, mm -hmm. including headwear. Yes. So there's, there's kind of some, some overflow there. So the caps that you've shown us mm -hmm. that would have served for Norse would very likely be appropriate for the Russian Slavic. Right. Um, and what Depending I was thinking- Depending on time period. Right. And what I was thinking of more of um, when you think of often when people think of Russian, they think of a kokoshnik. Um, so it's kind of um, the closest shape I can think of is if you think of, this is going to be a really random thing, the uh, crown that Aurora wears in sleep in Disney Sleeping Beauty <laughs> is very much shaped like a, a small little kokoshnik. Um, and often, um, and often they're just tied on with a tie um, instead of like some big full thing. But there are also other hats that are big and impressive. And I mean, it, yeah, it's the Slavic and, and Russian. They have some pretty impressive things, especially if you start getting into embroidery. There's an interesting rabbit hole you can fall down for those things on Pinterest if you're looking for uh, garb for Russian Slavic. Nice. Alan said he would like to make a, I won't pronounce this properly, a Phrygian cap? A Phrygian cap. cap. <laughs> can you tell us anything about that? I, I haven't done much research on that yet, um, but I'm happy to look up some and, and um, give opinions and let me, let me look right here. 
I believe. It's it's a simple hat to make. It's just another one of your right uh, different from a coif, except it's got a little knob on the top. Yeah, it's it was um I double checked and looked at it and it's definitely the one I was thinking of. <laughs> um or sometimes thought of as a smurf hat. <laughs> Yeah. I've, I've been called Papa Smurf before. <laughs> Don't know why. Don't know why. No clue. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's an interesting hat that was common in the Roman period, Anglo-Saxon period, and was very mm -hmm. popular during the French Revolution. So it's been around for a while. Right. And looking at them, because a lot of them, um, a lot of what you see um, they keep that very specific specific shaping. So I would look towards either, um, like if I were to make the hat personally, I would either do, um, I would try to do um, a block, partially blocked felt hat or do felting on the hat. Yeah. Can that be seen? That help at all? Yeah, you can try felting or um, honestly, with hair and hats, it's not unheard of to have baffles to just kind of if something needs to be up, but it's a nice soft look like if you look at some of them, you can try baffles also seeming any anytime you oh, bless you anytime you add a seam, um, it will add some sort of stiffness. Um, so. You would learn that in corsetry. <laughs> For those that needed to see one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's coming through nicely. All right, there was another question. Uh, is that how the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence <laughs> make their hats? I don't know which one that was in reference to, probably it's, a coif. It's probably in reference actually to the, uh, to the horned hat, ah, with the, only the horned hat. rainbow veil. Yes, um, I, I think that is one way. I don't know if that's specifically how they do it with the, with the, um, with the cones and everything, but I know that a lot of them do have the horned hats. I'm sorry? They usually stuff bras. Yes, yes, you're right, they do. Yeah, I, I did get asked if I was a, a sister of perpetual indulgence though when I wore that. <laughs> and I thanked them for the compliment. <laughs> yes, awesome bunch. <laughs> awesome, uh, uh, awesome. Yes, Anya is having some difficulty with her internet, giving her the ability to listen and view as well as share. But she said one of these times she will show us how to shorten one of those loops on the Saint Virgitus cap without having to have oh. it tied and untied. Oh, excellent. So. I think it has to do with the angle. You tip it over your head and where you're wrapping around mm -hmm. your hair. Uh, and I sent a picture of a friend of mine um, with one of the sisters in, in one of the hat, one of their hats that you can more easily tell that it's a brassiere because it's leopard. <laughs> So for those that want to check while we're still on here, Anya has shared a link for a St. Birgitta's cap tutorial that she's been using. Nice. And then Beatrice asked, is there a kind of hat for covering hair bangs? You might oh. want to talk about how hair and hats work together in the Middle Ages. Yes. Um, are so you want to cover bangs are they a specific kind of bang that you're is it basically you want to hold them out of out of the way or or you want yours to be down and you want to be able to cover them well i think i just want um since we are talking about time periods where uh where you pretty much uh had to show as little hair as possible mm -hmm. i kind of kind of want to cover as much possible without looking mm -hmm. uh, off. So depending on the time period and what kind of garb you're wanting to wear, 
Um, a lot of these, again, like talked about are mostly medieval, but the coif is a good basic hat. If you're not interested in that, you want something a little more feminine and it's still kind of solidly within the medieval period, um, you can always go with a barbette. And, um, and so the barbette is, um, there are a couple different styles, but it's usually the one that has the band that wraps around and it has a band around the chin and it covers the ears and the hair like that and is often paired with a veil or a smaller other like slightly structured hat. Um, and with the long hair, the great thing is, so one of the things I've been looking at and um, a friend and I have been looking at is um, not just, it's, it's how the hair and hat work together. And so um, I did a, I did a long um, research paper on French hoods. And part of that was also talking about how the hair worked with it because um, I don't know if people know much about French hoods, but when I first started researching them in like 2016, there were a couple, there were a couple, um, uh, I would say arguments within historical costuming groups um, about how they were worn and what they were made of. And one of the weird things to me was that people were questioning whether or not they used wire in them. Um, and and that was mainly because they said, well, there's no extant, there are no extant French hoods. However, there are extant wires. Uh, there are wires from extant um, uh, gable hoods and other hats of the same time period. So like as a milliner, my first thought is if the, if the technology was available, available and used on a different hat at the time, then yes, they would use it in that hat as well. Um, because it would be the simplest, easiest way to, to create the look. Um, and the other weird thing, like it's understandable to think of is how did the French hood stay on the head? And um, a big part of that when you don't have extant pieces is that you're really relying on artistic interpretations of, of something. And so um, working in costuming and everything, I'm supposed to be able to interpret sketches, costume sketches and whatnot. But ultimately there are artistic interpretations of something that was there in period. So um, depending on the artist, you didn't know if they were showing seams, you didn't show if they were showing, if they were showing the correct fabric. Um, for a while there, people were thinking French hoods were only ever in red and black and white. Um, but then you have to take into account that um, if someone was sitting for a portrait, they're more likely going to use their more expensive fabrics, which would have been the red and black, the red and black, and and um, and velvets and things. Um, I found. Sorry, I'm getting. I'm digressing. <laughs> I apologize. Um, We're enjoying but, it. But one of the things I, I looked at, I had. Um, I have a friend who had made an English cap that had is the style of English cap that has like a little poof on the back, but has slightly structured front brim and ear cover piece. And it wraps around the back. And so I looked at that and I looked at um, some other patterns that people were using for French hoods and I kind of combined them and made um, a structure that looked like a structure that came around but it also was open in the back so that it could go around. If someone had braids um, on the back of their head, it would be held in place around the hair. Um, and then with layers of a French hood, so the, the coif and the, and, um, the paste and the, the hood itself and all those, if they weren't stitched together, which often, it, that's another tangent, sorry. <laughs> um, it made sense to just have them pinned together. I mean, that's the technology that people were using. Why would they not use it on a French hood? Um, and now there's more research. Every time I look at French hoods, research has changed. And so I have to like, I have to look at it yet again. <laughs> okay. 
So um, catching up in the chat here, Alan was saying there's lots of hemp in Oregon and uh, mm -hmm. Catherine shared the Dharma Trading Company has some really nice hemp fabric. Excellent. Uh, the summer cloth makes nice caps and coifs, she said. Beatrice wants mm -hmm. to know if muslin makes good coifs. Um, muslin can make a decent coif. I usually use muslin. If you have a thicker muslin, it will. Um, I often will use muslin though as a mock-up, um, but that doesn't mean that if you have a mock-up that fits well, you can't use it. Um, the biggest thing is um, muslin, if you, when you wash it, it will, it will be forever wrinkled. Um, we think of linen as this fabric that is forever wrinkled and, and that's, that has some truth to it, but um, you can iron those wrinkles out much easier in linen than you can out of muslin. Um, and it has a, it, you want to, pr you want to pre-wash it for a hat because especially like a coif, because a coif is something you want to be able to wash, um, cause it will get nasty. Okay. Um, then Magda said, Magda said the problem with the pictures of the Slavic headwear is it's always from the front. No idea how the darn things look from the back. And she did include a link here, here, but I, while I was trying to do some research for Slavic uh, and Russian stuff, I did find a place called the Kievan Rus Park, um, which with politics of the Ukraine, who knows if it's still there. Um, but if you look online, um, they have some great photos and like it looks like an SEA event with with uh, stick and board buildings kind of um, but they have a great because they're they're intended they have people who come in as actors to portray uh, the Kevin Roos and it's basically like a park where people go in to um, to step back in time and play in that time period and watch sword fights and all that stuff and they have basically heavy fighting with steel, steel swords. So that's kind of fun. Um, ouch. Crazy people. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> so Anya has sent a couple of photographs. She couldn't figure out how to put them on our Zoom link, but she sent them to my phone. Okay. This is his, her uh, cap, barbette, and fillet, fillet. Yes. Can you see that? Yes, exactly. Okay. That's it. Thank you. That is a, that's exactly what I was talking about. It like, works really well for you know helping hide hair and things. And this is the same with the veil. Mm -hmm. Nice long veil, quite lovely. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> I'm playing. Sorry, I apologize, Anya. And the barbette and fillet are nice because um, um, it gives a similar a similar silhouette to where if you like if you have a wimple, obviously it's going to be covering more. But if you're in a, a hotter location, the uh, barbette and fillet will like give you a little more airflow. <laughs> right. Up. Okay. So. Um... I had a question, but I was so busy with everyone else's, I forgot mine. I guess it'll come <laughs> back to me. Somebody else think of something while I try to remember. We'll just sing the Jeopardy theme at you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm not going to be using my thread cones to make cannon. <laughs> And, oh, my apologies. I'm going to mute myself while the dog barks. <laughs> I'll be back. Oh, my goodness. My favorite hat that I've ever made. And oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. Okay. That is a really tough question. Probably the one I've worn the most is my, uh, has been, I, I had, I used to have a bicocket like the, the one that I showed 
um, but it had a wool lining, um, but I gave it away to a friend. Um, they really liked the hat and I said, here you go. Um, so that was my doofy gnome hat. I wore that a lot. Um, oh my goodness. I, I am, uh, my, my friend Taryn, she's the one who is in the photo uh, with the German garb. Um, I got permission to use her photo, don't worry. Um, but we are, we've been working together because I, I tend to do hats and shoes and she does a lot of patterning and costuming. So we work really well together. She does patterning and I'll do, I'll do embellishments. And, and um, so she's been doing a lot of research on Saxon garb. And, um, and so I help, I work with her a lot with how to figure out what, what the hat is doing. Um, so I, I'm excited to make my own uh, Telebraten, Telebrae. So like nice big platter style hat with feathers um, because it's, it's portable shade. <laughs> what what uh, persona would that fit with? That would be um, Saxon or uh, Lance Connect. And time period? Um, 1530s Germany. So, uh, well, 1530s to 50s. <laughs> okay. Little little range there. Very um, Shrewsbury time period. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, as I started to say before, my dog so rudely interrupted. <laughs> I'm not probably going to use my thread cones to help make my hats. But <laughs> I've been fascinated with some of the more elaborate elevated headwear mm -hmm. that uh, I don't even know how to describe them. I'm sure they're a version of a henan. It's something very tall and pointy with veils tossed over them. Mm -hmm. And there's two points and there's, I think I even saw one with three points, but that may have been an illusion depending on <laughs> how I was looking I, at the picture. I, I, and then there's the butterfly henans as well where it's mostly just yes. like wire and veiling and a lot of i i have a friend who made a henan a shorter wider henan um out of a lampshade <laughs> why not <laughs> she found a like a little table lampshade and she's like wait that's the right shape and size for my head and so and she, she wasn't even drunk so she covered no she wasn't drunk she covered it with different fabric and just used the framework for it and turned it into that. Um, this is why there's the C <laughs> in SCA. Right? <laughs> yes. Yes. So um, I, I've also been really, so my, my friend and I, we've also for years have joked about making different reticulated headdresses. Um, so there's the, the beer can cozy hat, <laughs> the party hat. That we've joked about wanting to actually turn into and hide so we have plans to make little beer can koozie hats but make them to where you can fit like little uh reusable sippy cups and then we're going to line the ed or edge the veil with food grade tubing small food grade tubing that goes into the cup and you can just be coy and take a drink um but I want her to have that one. And then I want to make the wider one that like sticks way out and the, it's a wider, shallower version. Um, and I want to stick in like a little cup with chips and a little cup with like salsa and have a party on the go. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Anya sent me another photograph to share. I'm not sure how well this is going to work from my phone because it's small. So what I'm doing is enlarging it and it'll take two showings. This is one of those wired headdresses. Yes. Yeah. And, I, and the gentleman looks rather like he's wearing a straw cap, mm -hmm. a straw Probably farmer's is. hat. Probably is, yeah. And here are two more of those lovelies. 
the mm. tall, wired, veiled. I don't even know what to call those. Do you happen to know? Mm. With the wire framework, butterfly wire cat frame. kind of. I, I, I don't know if they're. I'm sure they I, have a name somewhere, but. Yeah, because I know the, the, because there's the, yeah, that looks like the horned hat. That one, I think it's a form of reticulate. It's usually often when I find, like, if you look for a silhouette of a hat, it's all these different silhouettes similar to that labeled reticulated headdress. Um, reticulated, huh? Yeah. And what does that mean in respect to a headdress? Reticulated. Reticulate. I, I don't know a lot of stuff. I have no idea. <laughs> I have to Google that. Now we have, in case you hadn't noticed folks, we have reached the stage where we're really all sharing and talking and learning from our wonderful guest speaker here. So you can unmute and have that. <laughs> Lay on. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Reticulated headdress. I wanted to ask, have you ever done any work with, you know, fake braids or, or um, hair enhancements of various kinds. Uh, have you done any work in that area? I have a bit, yes. Um, but do you see my hair is very short? This is actually long for what it's been. I used to have um, like shaved sides and and uh, so um, when I have my German, the German soft cap. So in the picture, ooh, the picture of. Uh, do you remember from the presentation, the picture of my friend and I in our German? Yeah. And I have like the white cap on. Um, so those actually kind of go back a little bit further because it's intended for your hair to be braided in a circle on top. And then the hat, the, I had the um, essentially a coif over that holding it in. And then this long linen piece um, that, so this is goes on the back of the head it's really wrinkly right now. Mm -hmm. This is the center front. So it goes on and you tie it and then it has this long bit that you twist and turn around and you twirl it around and it's intended to like go around a braid. Like um, a turban. Kind, kind of, um, but it's, it's not as bulky as a, as a turban. Um, it's more of like, like, if you look at German garb, they'll have like this tall thing. Um, since I don't have long hair, I had a fake yarn braid on there. Um, I borrowed my friend's fake yarn braid and another time I, I just used a dish towel. Um, <laughs> Love it. Again, the C in SCA. Um, and I, I have, um, cause I used to have long hair. So I have cuttings from my hair that I'm planning to use. Um, not quite that full. Oh. Thanks. Do you need to go out? Do you need to pee? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, the crescent part would be okay. interesting to make. Sorry, my, my dog has to go out. Oh. So well, we'll still be here. <laughs> um. So I did Google reticulated headdress and it's giving me all the elevated glories. Right. Yes, exactly. No, no particular definition, just right. Just lots, lots of, of images of lots of images. And you tend to see uh, images from this book pop up a lot. Um, this is women's hats and headdresses and hairstyles. Um, which I, so I have, you know, it's when you evaluate your, when you evaluate your, your sources when doing research, this is one that I'll use to just to get like a very basic silhouette um, from a time period. Um, I don't use it for detail though. Uh, for detail, that's when you go into um, like start with paintings and you can do paintings and you can do um, uh, look for what any extant pieces if they happen to have any, that's always best. Um, when I was doing research for French hoods, I actually went into um, 
I, I, I found a, I found a, a source that talked about and quoted a lady's um, household budget from 15, from the 1570s. Um, and it listed uh, the amounts they paid for French hood or pieces of a French hood in it. So I use that in my research, in my paper. Um, but yeah, so sources evaluating them, there's some, like, <coughs> They're not necessarily uh, sources that you want to say, hey, I got all of my information from this. It's really a good place to start to get some of the terminology down and to look at the silhouettes. Um, and that kind of gives you, can give you an idea. Um, this is what uh, from the neck up looks like. It's just kind of a white with purpley lavender print on it and then it has a picture of a lady with a 19th century hat. Um, again, if you're, if you're interested in millinery and you ever find that book for sale or anything, get it. Okay. I think I found mine at Powell's World of, book, World of Books. Love Powell's. Yeah. Doesn't come much better. Powell's is the place. <laughs> so a lot of those reticulated. Uh, Anya said that you don't know how to do the crescent part. A lot of those reticulated headdresses, um, it's about finding what the framework is, the structure. Um, and some of them are literally just wire frames that are covered in fabric. And um, other times you can, I, you can, I've seen people use different methods. So I've seen that I've seen um, stiffened fabrics. Um, yeah. Thank you, Caridwin. Okay. I have found more information. It says the reticulated headdress of the 15th century, the crispinette calls, C A U L S. Calls, yes. Yes. Headdresses 15th century. Right. So the calls are often what you see as like the little netted things over the ears, um, the netted. And again, that's why I'm keeping some of my own hair in case I want to turn them into braids to make calls for myself that match my hair color. Yeah. I'm just weird like that. <laughs> I saw an image of a call here. Let's see if I can find it again. never there when you want it um i just st stuck this in the chat but um hmm. i don't even know if anybody can hear me yes we, we can, can hear you yeah, yeah reticulated refer I, I i was napping in the middle of this reticulated refers to a net or a net <laughs> so it's referring to the well a headdress that has either a net component or is decorated with a net like uh, decoration motif and you can mm -hmm. see that in a lot of the pictures that you showed there are there are nets um, right. or the sides of it have uh, uh, so, some sort of a, a you know a trim or line decoration on it or interwoven line so mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. So now I will try to stay awake. Well, it's good to have you with us. You weren't here earlier. I well, I was. I was on and off, but I I oh. laid down, and that was a mistake. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I generally take a nap around four or five in the afternoon. I'm just old that way, and I didn't do that today. I have to be yeah. up early tomorrow. I'm going to, I don't know. I better not close my eyes. Well, also my power <laughs> went off in the middle of this. So, wow. Um, so it, you know, and I, I, I thought what a great time to have a nap. It's, you know, dark. <laughs> well, thank you for staying with us. Yes. Oh, well, now I'm back. Now I'm back. Where do you <laughs> hail from? Uh, Meridies. 
Wonderful. Um, although I have lived in seven different kingdoms, so. Wow. And they wow. haven't caught me yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I teach a class, and I need to resurrect it again, on uh, costuming for queen-sized ladies. And and it's not a technique class. It's 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 more a fashion style class. But one of the things that I emphasize uh, the the hairstyling or you know whatever that goes with the garb uh, mm -hmm. because it balances things out. And especially for a larger lady like myself, if I've got a you know a a beautiful sumptuous Elizabethan outfit or or a hoop blonde on. And I don't have anything on my head. I look like I've got a this little tiny head and this great huge body. Um, <laughs> and I'd really rather just have a you know a great huge head to go along with a great huge body. Uh, uh, so, as I said, this so I'm I'm learning more and I'm you know techniques and stuff. Right. That's great. It's all about equalizing the silhouette overall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, plus it hides my short hair. Yes. <laughs> well, I went to grab my basket because I thought I had a completed St. Birgitta's cap in here, but no, I only have the one in progress at this point. Oh, gosh, I should put mine on and we can all wear so, them. <laughs> now, this one's not going on yet. It's still in three pieces. But this might help make it more clear if you see the one piece mm -hmm. I've hemmed all the edges before I attach them because I'm going to you do the lacing the uh, interlaced uh, herringbone stitch to connect the two halves mm -hmm. and here is how the back is gathered in a, bar, a small section so for those that didn't know how that went together mm -hmm. that, will look, that will look nice I hope so. Especially with that herringbone stitch lacing around it. I've been my, practicing. Mine, I just did the, uh, the flat overlap of the seams and the, the uh, essentially whip stitching yeah. along the edges. I've been practicing that stitch in color so that I can see it more effectively because it really is complex in my oh, opinion. Yeah. I'm not an embroiderer, so... I don't know if that's going to show up even. That does show up. Nice. That's a great way to practice too. We we often um, at the university when we're teaching beginning sewing, we have people pick out a bright or oh, like their favorite color to practice with. Maybe it shows better where there's nothing behind it. I can't tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks anyway. Nice. Well, I've enjoyed this. I think all of us, when we start, we, we do a basic tunic or a basic garb dress or something. And we say, okay, I can go to an event. And then the more time we are involved, the more elaborate it becomes. We keep adding pieces and layers and we get to a point where I'm dressed, but my head is naked. What do I do? So this really does help fill in that gap. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Aya has a great question. And I think uh, I, I personally don't know the answer to it. The talking about the, the um, herringbone stitch on your cap that you're working on. Whether it was to mend it or enlarge it, or it was, I think it was originally but, done as a decorative element. They're, the extant finds they have for it, it doesn't look like it was an afterthought. It, it looked like the whole cap had been originally made that way because mm -hmm. it runs from the front all the way down the back. Right. I cheated on mine. It's machine Ooh. embroidery down the, cent oh, the nice. center. Yeah, Very it doesn't nice. fit. It, I need more hair to fill it up. Because otherwise it kind of sticks up in a point. Mm -hmm. But with fake hair, 
Right. Or, or you know, or, put a scarf in there. Well, I usually wear it with a veil. There you go. So uh, that 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 helps a lot. So, but yeah, I thought well, since everybody seems to have theirs, I'll put mine on. I appreciate mm-hmm. that. Yeah. I feel it's, like I should run back and know, find all, my completed one. Yeah, all the all the curl girls do it. <laughs> and now it's coming off. Because <laughs> it, it's not cool to wear inside, is it? It's warm. Well, it's not that bad. Uh, get the air conditioning is kind of high, but it, it does. You, one of the other things that I like about head head headgear is that it covers up bad hair. Yeah, I'm with you there. <laughs> and I am certainly suffering from bad hair right now. So, uh, yeah. I still haven't had my COVID haircut. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Right now, my hair is all pulled up in a ponytail just to hide it. Even debated putting on my Tuesday tiara to hide the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> Since I did my finally get my camera to work. Yay. And my version of fix the COVID hair. Ah, there. <laughs> Are you wearing a headband? Your screen froze. No, it's one of those neck gator thing. Oh. But I've got it. I pulled it all the way down and then pulled it up over my hair. Cute. It's, it's um Oh now I have to ask, what are you works. working on? It's that doll. Um, the one that Alan made? Sorry, my camera's at a really bad funky. No, no. This is the one. This is the rolled fabric doll oh. that I've been working on off and on. It's a Slavic folk doll. She has and I'm a hat. almost done. I've got. Yes, she does. She's got a little coif. And she's Ooh. getting her, her little shawl. And I'm just, I'm like within a few stitches. And then I can send it to Jessica. So whoever was asking about hats for the Slavic garbs, there we are. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, what's her SCA name? Uh, Ma- Maria. Uh, just was Laurel last year. Um, she, she, her specialty is Russian uh, and Slavic. And especially like the Novgorod era uh, stuff, the early... Um, or mid medieval, not in other words, not Renaissance um, stuff. And um, she, that kind of headdress, whoops, sorry, there, get my water bottle out of the way. That kind of headdress is what she wears. It's, it's tied in the back. It's a, um, like a, a big scarf folded in triangle and it ties under the back. And then there's a wrap that goes around it and I'm like waving my hands in the air and you can't even see them because my camera is weird today. Um, let's see. I'll try this again. Let's see if I can fix it. Yeah. Oof. And maybe get down. No, that's not going to work. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so she, she there's a, a wrap that goes around it, which I've got represented by the, the little braid on the doll and then the temple rings oh hang God. off of the off of the veil um and late period this is it you see it like this with the the little uh with the babushka babushek the scarf and so that's what i'm doing and because this i'm finishing this so i can send it to her finally um <laughs> before i end up with alan's dolls the um so, yeah, that's what I'm playing with anyway. But uh, I'm sorry I don't have my other stuff here. Um, if I if I thought about it, I would have pulled out my Brigitte cap. But the the thing is with that one, you don't have to do the tie. Um, Miriam showed me. Uh, she's the one that uh, the link that I that I put up earlier, Sinister Spinster. Um, the uh, what you do is you take the the tube of the tie and you sort of shove it into itself like you sew like that and then you stitch it down and 
so you're creating a fold in it. If it stretches or something like that, then you can shorten it. Um, I had to shorten one of mine by about an inch because um, it stretched out after I made it. And you don't have to then fiddle with it up and down. I can't find any photos of, of my uh, Brigitte cap uh, and me in the Brigitte cap right now. I don't know why, but I don't apparently have any of them labeled that way. Thanks for sharing all that with us, Sonia. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I like that. <laughs> now I want a doll. <laughs> we all want dolls a doll for you and you get it all and you get it all you know that's probably what's about to happen um i don't know how many alan is going to be patient enough to make but when we get those uh for those who don't know what we what we're playing with is bartholomew babies these solid wooden dolls that um alan oh Boyer. bonnie do you have of it yeah that alan bowyer uh is making sort of it my poking and prodding we've, we've had this on a back burner now for almost two years because he didn't get enough time before the uh wood shop shut down and <laughs> so he's back at it and i don't know how patient he's going to be um but i'm hoping he's going to be very because there's a lot of people who are interested in having the dolls whether they are going to dress their own or not because that's the idea. The dolls normally come naked, and but they're already sort of shaped like a person. Um, Alantha, do you have? Uh, I'm scrolling, looking Alan. for one. Yeah, because he had them up. He put them up on the Audiantum list. Um, He's also showing them right now. Oh, he is. Where are you, Alan? Oh, yes. Oh, where <laughs> if, are you? Oh, if yes. You, if you look at your screen, you can click on View. And it'll give you an option for the person who's talking to be the big part of your screen. And then we could ask Alan to unmute so that we can see his dolls better. You have your choice of woods. You've got maple, you've got mahogany, and you've got walnut, because love comes in all colors. They're adorable. How long are they, well, Alan? They are so cool. I mean, I wouldn't mind having one of those myself. Alan, how long is each doll? This batch is five inches, but it's not like they had an industry standard. So love will also come in different sizes as well. Um, the, uh, the, the dolls that are out there of the Bartholomew baby type range from two inches to 18 inches. And the 18 inches is actually a 10 inch body with cloth legs tacked onto the bottom of it. cloth legs yes yeah it's like part part rag doll part um uh part wood it's there and they're called taka in some places poppets takas babies uh and the bartholomew babies they're very late period um actually into uh, up into the 1700s and the little girls that you see in the portraits clutching a painted doll uh, a lot of the time it's a Bartholomew baby or a doll that looks really stiff. Um, there's one, one picture of a girl it's, who's totally naked. I don't remember now exactly why, but it's, she's hanging onto her mother's arm. It's an Italian picture. Um, it's one, I think it's one of those clustering around Jesus type pictures. Um, but she's got one of those dolls under her arm and there are several of the um, the English portraits where the little girls have dolls. Um, Ninety dollars I, I think the Annabelle Annabelle Arabelle Annabelle Stewart. Uh, it, it that's what she's that's what she has, because the dolls it's a basic shape, but then you put clothes on it, and the arms are part of the clothing, the legs. Um, if you decide to put legs on it, because with a skirt, you don't really need legs. Um, it, if there are legs attached, most of the time they're just cloth, um, like a kind of shape like that bag hat thing, except skinny. 
um, and they're tacked right onto the butt end of the doll with like a, what looks like a tack actually, rather than a nail. In other words, I've been playing with these a lot. Sorry, <laughs> I'm doing that same stupid thing where I just start to babble. Sorry. We all sort of do that, don't we? That's why we're here. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, you, you asked me a question, uh, how patient I am. And well, yeah, due to the, the changing nature, nature of Coronet, it looks like uh, I probably got some slack in my schedule. So at the moment, I'm ready to deliver nine, uh, three each, uh, maple, walnut, and mahogany, uh, all five inches. <clears throat> I can send us <clears throat> send us out by the end of the week, uh, and I can start working on some of the larger ones next week. Okay, and I have actually already have the boxes ready for several people to go out. At, you know, so it's a matter of I get them, and then they then they go right straight back out again. Excellent. <clears throat> Uh, I hope people take photos of the, the completed doll and send them back. <clears throat> that was sort of the deal. It's kind of what I told everybody had to happen. <laughs> now, did we'll you, see what it does. Did you tell them the, the history of the Bartholomew baby and what the slang term means today? Uh, I did that a while back uh, because a lot of this discussion has been on the SCA Toys and Toy Makers group. Yes. And I, I went through and explained to everybody um, about at the same time I was doing that with you. Mm -hmm. um, I should probably do it again. At, you know what? Yeah, I need to write something out to send it with the dolls. And I can will. You, can you share it with us briefly here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it's pretty simple. The, there was the St. Bartholomew Fair. And... The, that's where they got the name Bartholomew Babies because they were one of the most popular items at the fair um, for a long, long time. I mean, we're talking a couple centuries. Um, and there are a lot of extant pictures of little girls with this type of doll. Um, the, a lot of the time dolls in that time frame are just called poppets or babies. Uh, the Bartholomew Babies, it's a specifically English name um, for a specific type of doll, but, uh, they're as generic as Barbie dolls. Everybody calls it a Barbie doll, even if it comes out of a Chinese factory and it doesn't even vaguely look like a Barbie, if it's 11 and a half inches tall and it's a fashion doll shape. These are that same kind of thing. Um, and so people call them poppets or babies. And like, a, and I think I said it earlier, Taka in German, um, I'll, uh, I'm trying to think exactly. I'll, the thing is, they're also the descendant of solid dolls that were made uh, in and painted some of the time, whatever, carved directly from a branch, which is, I think, why they're round. Um, that was what people were expecting, so they kept the shape. Um, and those show up actually back into the late Roman era, although at the time they had a tendency to have articulated legs, um, you know, carved out of wood or ivory or something. Um, but the tree branch shapes show up in like the Novgorod finds. They show up uh, in some of the Norse finds. I'm trying to think of the name. It's not Biroka. It's the other one, uh, the other big Norse find. Um, and they even show up in the Inuit, uh, things that they dug up in some of the Inuit archaeological uh, digs up, up in Alaska. Um, as a round doll with almost no features, just sort of a vaguely human shape. Um, they tended to be dressed and mostly dressed as noble women. But you see them in the pictures as well, as dressed as like uh, peddler, do peddler dolls. And those are a direct descendant of the Bartholomew babies. The peddler dolls of the 17 and 1800s, where you've got a, a, wom a woman shape um, that usually doesn't have legs. It just has arms. Very little in the way of features. It's dressed. And then the hands, kind of like this one's holding the baby. The hands hold an elaborately decorated tray of stuff, 
whatever it might be, fruit or uh, cigars in one case. Um, uh, another one has uh, what looked like uh, looked like they were intended to be gingerbread cookies, hard gingerbread, lead cooking. Um, and so the the predecessors were these carved from a branch, relatively featureless dolls. The descendants are then these peddler dolls, the solid solid wood or armless, legless um, dolls. Um, if you've ever done anything with Waldorf school, they use the little peg dolls. And those are a very much farther down the road descendant. Uh, the ones that are like that tall. Now you can't see it around my water bottle that are about that tall um, up to about yay so. And again, featureless and dressed. Um, I'm not sure what more to say about them other than that. I do. Uh, I've got a few words. Uh, yeah, the, the St. Bartholomew Fair was held in Spitalfields in North London. And uh, they would get pretty loud and boisterous and uncouth and riotous, which is why they only held the fair, you know, on, you know, once a year or something like that. And people would get drunk, flat out drunk. And so a person who was behaving badly was called a St. Bartholomew baby. Uh, the, <laughs> the Bartholomew babies were always dressed in the, in the height of fashion. And so if somebody was overdressed, you know, trying to show off their, their outfits, again, they'd be called a St. Bartholomew baby because they look like they're just, you know, dressed in the nines. Uh, <laughs> Now, just recently, I read, I wish I'd bookmarked it, I'd sent it on. There was a comment that uh, they put a, an enormous amount of detail and work into these costumes, making them the height of fashion. So people visiting from, from other cities, visiting London from other cities, would buy these dolls, take them back home again, and show them to the local tailor and say, I want something like this. Yeah, because they were used as fashion dolls. Yeah. The thing is that the pictures, the drawings and the engravings from the Bartholomew Fair of Bartholomew babies do show a range from peasant all the way to nobility. Um, actually, what's interesting is uh, the St. Audrey's Fair was one of the ones that was known for really elaborate things on the toys. Uh, even down to putting gold studs into tops. And so if you ever think, hear the word tawdry, yeah, ah. that's where it comes from. So did you have any special trouble with turning these, Alan? Oh. Uh. Only with the brain weasels. <laughs> oh you know, dear! I, I, they, I stood up in front of the lathe you know, for the first time since the uh, the great epidemic shut everything down. I said, "Alan, you know, it's been months and months and months since you've turned anything on a lathe. You've lost it." I said, "Oh, for heaven's sakes! It's been you know less than two years. Muscle memory, blah blah blah. I still know a skew from a round nose, you know." Maybe I have lost a certain amount of grace and style, but you know, this is a basic spindle. There's nothing complicated. I was turning objects that would you know, fit borders and tenon where this would be the lid that would have to fit on. That that takes precision, but this 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 is this is lathe 101. If anybody were interested in learning how to to turn things on the lathe, this would probably be a good thing to start with because it's just pure spindle work. Well, that's an interesting idea. So no, the, the, the troubles that I had turning these. What, babe? All between the ears. Of course, <laughs> they did. Oh, this doesn't want to go where it's supposed to. Come to mama, come on. Well, we wandered a little bit off from hats, but not so far. We're talking about high fashion with Bartholomew babies. 
my doll is done. Ooh. So oh, she's, she's finished. Cute. She is cute. Oh, okay. She, she's finished. You have 2,500 to go? No, that's the only one I was planning on making, <laughs> which is probably a good thing. It's only taken me, what, two and a half years start to finish? <laughs> oh. That might not be the thing for you to math produce. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. So my next project. Oh. I like doing creative things like that. I, I had a children's boutique for a while and I loved making little dresses, but I hated when somebody says, I want one just like that. Cause I don't uh -huh. like doing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> I like the creative, okay, on to something different art. Yep. I'm with you yeah, there. Um, I can't even make both sides of a pasanki the same. <laughs> what is that? A Ukrainian Easter egg. I can't even do the same thing on both. I can't. <laughs> but if you turn it over, no one's going to know it's not the same. <laughs> People tend to think the most difficult part is putting like a new design on something, when in reality, the most difficult part is recreating that design again. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Unless you're Alan, who is such a pro at recreating, you know, a dozen Bartholomew babies. Alan blows the curve. Yeah, he really does. <laughs> He's not here, is he? We're not, we're talking about him. He's not even here. <laughs> I'll get him later. <laughs> you can tell him we talked about him. It's here. <laughs> He's still here. He just keeps turning his video feed on and off. <laughs> Ah, there he is. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. We love you, Alan. <laughs> I was just so thrilled to find somebody who was willing to turn them because I've been looking for somebody to do this for something like 15 years. Um, there was Alan all that time. Well, I hadn't met him yet. <laughs> the... Um, because I started, well, I started the research on the doll stuff. You know, I'm gonna, I am gonna—I should probably do a dolls class for this sometime. Yes, I'll have to, if you want to put me down like for that. that. Yes, yes, you're on. We'll discuss huh. timing. Well, I, I started doing the research on this stuff, prob well, well before the internet got going. Um, I pretty much, it's been constant, um, since the uh, early part of the 90s. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've been at this a while. You're on, yeah. you're on. We're going to have you teach dolls. Okay. I have to figure out how to get the photos to come up the way y'all do, because um, I don't know. Um, but I've got all the photos and I've got all the, cause I, I teach the class pretty regularly, used to do it for Ithra, but I've done it at a number of events. So, but so whoever it was, I, I saw somebody post in chat that they were interested in dolls. So whoever that was, keep an eye out. It won't be long. We have openings. Ah, oh, I should also snag the oh on the Anya's quest site I'll snag the link find it because I have a bunch of toy stuff research posted all wow. right now it it's it's very important for me to re, to remind everybody that uh, the chat is a wonderful feature but the minute the session ends uh, any notes that you've left vanish. It's long gone. So if there's somebody who's made left messages saying, I would love to know more about dolls. Uh, Send it. I'm going to be able to, to rescue those names or something. Um, well, you, you know, can save the file of the chat. 
Okay. How do we do that? Oh, um, awesome. if you've got the chat, uh, do you have it as a pop up or on the side? It's on the side. Okay, you should go over and down where you type stuff in. Yes. Where it says everyone, if you keep going across to the right, you yes. should see a piece of paper, you should see a smiley face, and then three dots. Click yes. on three dots. You should yes. save chat. Is there a chat? Save chat. Oh, I love this. Now, where does it save the chat to? It depends. Um, <laughs> um, bottom of the ocean. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Finding it again will be the trick. Finding it again will be the trick. However, when I click save chat, it gives you the option to show in folder. So it should pop up the folder it saved it to. Yeah. Mm. For mine, I can do by no, pulling up me that. recent documents. Um, and it'll show me most recently saved things. You can do a search on your computer by date, not by file name, but by date. Okay. Get the most recent thing and rename that sucker as soon as you can. <laughs> yeah. Because otherwise it's like file meeting and it'll say the meeting name and it'll give the date and then the exact time that you saved it. And it's just like a bazillion miles long. So. Okay. Um, well. I will attempt that before I close this meeting out. Yes. Thank you for that tip. That's awesome. I did not know we could do that. And if anybody is interested in going and looking at some of the, the, the Bartholomew babies or the solid wooden babies, the link I just put up in the chat goes directly to the page where the first couple are definitely uh, Bartholomew baby types. Cool. Um, and you can click click on the pictures to get them to pop open. Cool. Oh yeah, yep. I can see that. Yep. And um, my missus wanted me to show you one of our uh, a, a folk doll that I have not made. I purchased this at a Russian fair, but it is she is handmade. She has glass Aww. eyes. She's, She's my little cute. Mama. She's such a cutie, yeah. Like like the Bartholomew dolls, she has something in her hand. She has a little teacup. Oh, she's actually a very cute. Doll. She's adorable. What's interesting is I had several dolls like that as a child. My family's not Russian; they're Czech. Uh, but the Slavic the the Slavic uh, <laughs> meme sort of goes through it. Yes. Little it's, shoes. It's all runs to that. Oh, oh that shoes, those are put adorable. those shoes back up there. Say, put them up there. Little shoes, little shoes. They just cute. Yes. <laughs> are they? Going on. Are, are they made out of? They look like they're made out of burlap, or is it some yeah. kind of a reed? No, that's that's, burlap? that's a burlap. But I think it's meant to like represent a reed because yeah. of the, the thick weave. Um, yeah, summer slippers are made out of like birch bark and um, and things like that. Yep. And yeah, her little her little kerchief. Um, she's got a, a one kerchief to go over her head here, and then one goes over, goes around under her chin, and is tied in the back. Babushka. Her little babushka. Yeah. <laughs> that always sounds funny to me because I grew up saying babuchka, which is Czech. Or so babuchka sounds strange. Oh dear. I, mean, I have to mute and take take a phone call. Thank you. <laughs> Come Hello. Back. Hello, Dame Johanna has Dame come Johanna from the is here. Wilderness. Welcome, Dame Johanna. Thank you. I'm so glad that you're all still here because I have a desperation question. So okay. I am back three days early from my vacation because I got smoked out um, last night at 2 a.m. I woke up coughing on what seemed to be an ash heap. Of course, I was in my bed in a tent, but uh, we just got hit by a massive wave of really nasty smoke. Hmm. Where so, were you? Uh, the Deschutes National Forest, just north oh. of Crane and uh, it, it had been smoky on and off all week. Um, you know, it kind of roll in and then it go away and then it roll in and go away. And last night was just awful. Anyway, so I spent the night packing instead of sleeping. Um, 
because I learned I can do a respirator sitting up, but not laying down. Oh anyway, um, <clears throat> what, my problem is I got back to my aunt's house. My family all are tougher than me. And so they stayed. I was like, I'm going home. I can't, I can't not breathe. Anyway. Um, I love y'all, but I also love my lungs. Yeah, that. Yeah. So I, all, everything I have smells like smoke. And I don't know what to do with it. I mean, other than wash the washables. Um, but is there something that you add to your wash to get rid of the smell of smoke? Is there a trick? Is there a better way of doing things than just washing it? I would add baking soda. That's my mm -hmm. thought. That's a good idea. Okay. If that doesn't Thank do you. it, run it again with vinegar. I was going to say white mm -hmm. vinegar. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And, and for the unwashable items, fresh air, if you can find some. Yeah. <laughs> Sunlight. Sunlight. Um, you, you know, can... if, it's, if it's washable but not washing machine sized, you could hang it outside and hose it down. Right. And, and maybe get a spray bottle with some vinegar. Mm -hmm. You can also yeah. try a spray bottle of um, the world's cheapest vodka. Uh, right, I've heard that. I've heard that. Spray. People will mix it with half and half with vodka and water. Um, in my costume yeah. shop, we mix it with rubbing alcohol because it also disinfects as a, you know, and it will evaporate quicker than water. Yeah. What now, you know? in your as costume long as shop, did that get rid of like cigarette smell? Because that's sort of like smoke smell. <sighs> we, that's, we never really tested it because people weren't allowed to use smoke yeah. in a costume or anywhere near costumes. Okay. Right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I, uh, and also uh... you have to pack your stuff away <laughs> after you've aired things out get one of those fridge packs of baking soda that you can open the sides that have a, a panel in them oh, that allows sure. uh, air to go through. Sure, sure. That's a great idea. Otherwise, it will just get stale. Packed away. Right. right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that helpful information. You guys are a wealth of knowledge. And I was like, when, when I got to the clear air, actually, by the time I got to Crescent up at the top of the pass, oh, on the other side of the pass, it was clear enough. And um, coming all the way down through Oak Ridge, it was beautiful, which it was not when we went over mm. last week. Uh, apparently, it rained through there. So that's wonderful. But, but uh, I, so of course, it was hilarious because I, was coming down the hill and every time I would turn on the fan and it would move the air in the car, it would smell awful. Where if I opened the window, it would smell fine. I was like, this is not what I was expecting. But uh, <laughs> so I'm just trying to like rescue myself from the smoke because now that I'm back to where the air is clearer, I don't, now I can smell it. <laughs> right. So. Anyway, thank you very much. And I hope you guys have a good rest of your evening. Also, well, welcome back. Um, I, I would also suggest maybe calling like a fire damage cleanup service. Ooh, yes. And seeing what, what, what advice they might be able or are we willing to give you. I think That's Belfour is one of those companies. Belfour. Okay. I'll have to look into that tomorrow. Thank you so much. I, uh, I stopped and bought soap, but <laughs> then I realized, like, I don't know if that will actually take the smell out. So we shall see. I think the first load is just about to get. It done. will come out. It's it's a little like going camping and being too close to the campfire and everything smells of campfire for a while. Right, but right. It does which, wash out. It does wash which out. Which is usual. It's just this was so much worse. Yeah. Well, sure, because it's compounded and you've got plastics and things that aren't meant to burn. Right, um, right, right. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys have a great evening. Welcome I'll hope back. to see you when the next one comes around. I'll okay. be in town at the right time. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. So before we move on, I want to ask, I see oh, Nordana's- Oh, recording. I see Nordana's Architects 
And I want to know who that is and where they hail from. Nordonis Architects. Um, oh, apologies, and- I've been using my uh, work account while sitting here doing work. I'm um, Marguerite from um, Southern Garden Lockhart, New Zealand. Well, welcome, Margaret. Glad to have you with us. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't say welcome earlier. I didn't see you before we really got into the class there. No, not a problem. I unfortunately missed the um, the earlier part about the hats, which is what I'm most interested in, but the dolls were certainly interesting too. Well, um, do you want to explain to her how you're going to try and share the the PowerPoint and things from the class? Yes, I have. Uh, I put together a PowerPoint that I can share, and I'm going to create a a handout document um, based on that information that kind of expands a little bit more. Um, and um, uh, I'll, Bonnie is the the event page is that after the state will that be will the I event be pages to... stay okay. and if you put it in the comments under the event it will excellent. be available so if you put a link down there that makes it available excellent that's what i'll do i'll probably and i plan to do the handouts in a google doc just so that it's i feel like google doc might be a little more accessible than word but if people want a word format just let me know as well Fabulous. Thank you very much. We've been having a lot of fun. We, we kind of got sidetracked talking about hats and then clothes and then dolls that needed hats and clothes. <laughs> we do that. We, we kind of hang out here and chit chat about India and everything after the event. So go down the merry garden path. Yes, and I'm now going to end the recording because we've been down that merry path for a while and it's going to be another long recording.